Professor Piketty is the world's leading expert on economic inequality, on its character and its origins and its consequences. And in his new book called A Brief History of Equality, he takes up the question uh, transcending national boundaries and takes up the history of global inequality and the ongoing historical struggles against it. Uh, this is important because the global south and the rest of the world is part of this history and he does a fantastic job in dealing with that. His book documents a history of social struggles and violent reactions, which we always have to remember, of gains punctuated by reverses and even disaster, but also a history of fitful movement towards reduced inequality in class, gender, race, and national access to resources. The book covers the consequences of the rise of capitalism, of slavery, of colon colonialism, and the constant struggles against them and all against their lingering effects. The issue of reparations, the long fight for democracy, socialism, freedom of, from discrimination, and for democratic, multicultural, and ecological society. With this in mind, he strongly advocates in favor of a participatory socialism, a word we don't hear so often in the United States, but is heard often outside of that. Professor Piketty will speak to about uh, about 40 minutes or 40, uh, 35 minutes uh, as he wants, and then he'll take questions. Now, I remind you, as I always do, that I ask all questioners to respect the rules of our seminars and the rights of others by keeping their queries short and confining to a single question. With that, welcome back to the New School, Professor Piketty. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks for your invitation. And uh, yeah, it's been such a long time and I hope uh, I will be able to see you again in New York in the not too distant uh, future. And thanks for your introduction, which uh, you know was a, a very good uh, introduction to, to what indeed I'm trying to say in this new book. So let me, uh, hold on, uh, let me share uh, my screen. What, what, what did I do? Uh, yeah, uh, share my screen. Um, okay, what, what did I do? Uh, yes. Okay, so I hope you can see now my screen. Yes, so I hope this is okay for everybody. Okay, so, so I'm going to talk to you today about this new book, A Brief History of Equality, which as, as you just said is, is uh, you know, is, is in the end, it's an optimistic book in the sense that this is a book where, you know, I'm trying to show that there is a long run movement toward more uh, equality, more political, social, racial, economic equality in the very long run. And, and uh, you know, this is a movement that, as you say, grounded in social struggle. So it's not a movement which happened uh, just like this, and it's not going to continue just like this. But, you know, I think uh, if we look at the history of this evolution, uh, you know, there are also grounds to, to uh, try to look at the future in a more, uh, um, a more positive way than we, we sometimes uh, sometime do. So I'm, I'm going to try to summarize, you know, some of the main uh, main arguments of the, of the book. Before I do that, let me uh, start with a sort of big picture of inequality in the world today by showing you some of the data that we recently published in the World Inequality Report, which is a, a big report that we published at the World Inequality Lab every four years. So we had a World Inequality Report in 2018, and we just published one in 2022. So the, you can look online to see a much more detailed description of the, of the report, and you can get actually the full report online. The, the, the report draws on the World Inequality Database, which is a very collective project involving uh, over 100 uh, researchers from all over the world, you know, collecting data on the historical evolution of inequality uh, of income and wealth, uh, both within countries and between countries. So we started with inequality of income and recently we've been moving in the direction of inequality of wealth and 
this recent report also goes uh, in the direction of including uh, uh, new data uh, on gender inequality and environmental inequality, which I, I will briefly uh, talk about. So let me start with, so, you know, initially when we started the project of the World Inequality Database, our first objective was to cover the entire world with respect to income inequality from a broad international perspective and also from an historical perspective. So the, one of the big difference with some of existing database is that not only we better cover the top of the distribution from the top to the bottom, uh, but also we have this historical perspective. So we go back to you know, the early 20th century and in some case to the 19th century or even late 18th century, which is very important in order to see that you know, the, the inequality is not frozen. You know, it, it changes over time. It depends on political mobilization. It can, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's man-made. You know, it depends on the institution, the social struggles and, and it's uh, it's not something that we should take for granted so let's start with this simple map so on this map you have for that's the situation for today or for the most recent year so this is the share of national income going to the top 10 percent so let's let's get the orders of magnitude right uh, you know if if you had this is the share going to 10 percent of the population so if you had complete equality they should get 10% of national income. If you had complete inequality, they should get 100% of national income. Now in practice, of course, it's always between 10 and 100, but as you can see, it varies quite a lot. Basically, it goes almost from 21 to 67. So the, the most equal country would have a top 10% income share of 20, 25, 30% of national income. That would be typically in Northern Europe and in Europe more generally. The most unequal country in the world in our database right now in South Africa, where it, it would be 67% in Brazil or Chile or Mexico, it will come next with 60, 65% of total income to the top 10. So uh, first conclusion, you know, it, it varies enormously. So it's not only, it doesn't go from 10 to 100, but it goes from 20 to 70. So, you know, it's absolutely enormous. This is true for the top 10% share. This is also true, and maybe it's even more spectacular if you look at the share going to the bottom 50%. So by definition, what doesn't go to the top 10 or bottom 50 goes to the 40% who are in between. I should say in the online database, you can get all the different percentile one by one for all the country. I cannot get into the details. So here I'm just giving really the big picture. So let's look at the bottom 50% share. So if you had, again, if you had complete equality, the bottom 50% should get 50% of total income. If you had complete inequality, they should get zero. In practice, they get between five and, and 30. So typically in Northern Europe, they will get about 25, 30% uh, of total income. In South Africa, they will get only 5%. And in Latin America, they will get uh, uh, you know, between five and, and 10%. So this makes an enormous difference. So basically, you know, if you are if you are fifty percent of the population and you get twenty five percent of total income, it means that your average income is about half of the average income of the entire population. So of course you're poorer by definition because after all you're the bottom fifty percent, but you're not uh, hugely poorer. Whereas in South Africa, if you have only five percent of total income and, and you are fifty percent of the population. It means that on average, your income is only one tenth of average income. So there's a huge gap between you and, and the and the you know the average income of your of your uh, uh, country. Uh, so again, enormous variation, which shows uh, that distribution matters. And if you only look at aggregate GDP or average national income per capita, you know you're going to miss a lot because you know the bottom 50 percent share can vary by a factor of one to five, say from five to 25%, which means that for the same uh, aggregate GDP or average income per capita of a country, the average income at the bottom 50% can vary from a factor of one to five with enormous consequences on poverty and access to, to you know, basic uh, uh, goods and food and, 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 and everything. So 
it's very important to look at the distribution. Conclusion number one. Conclusion number two, this enormous variation you see uh, between countries, you also see them over time. So in fact, you know, today we, we find that the, the richest country in the world including you know, in Europe, but also to a lesser extent in uh, uh, North America and in Japan are uh, somewhat more equal than countries in the global South, you know, if you think of uh, Africa or Latin America or India, or, uh, et cetera. Uh, uh, but it, it has not always been like that. So if you look back 100 years ago, Uh, and you look at the, say, the top 10% share in, in Britain or France or Germany or, or Sweden, uh, which actually was a very unequal country 100 years ago, it was, okay, it was not South Africa, but it was close to Latin America. It was like uh, the top 10% share was 50, 60%. And the bottom 50% share was 10%. And it is through you know, the construction of the welfare state, through the construction of progressive taxation, through a complete change in the legal fiscal system, following enormous uh, uh, social struggles, political mobilization, and also political shocks after World War I and World War II, that rich countries you know, have, have become, at the same time, more equal and more prosperous. And th this historical rise of more equality or at least less inequality, less extreme inequality has been a, a, a central component in the, in the modernization process and, and the development process of rich countries. And I think that's a sort of number one message to be clear about when we talk about uh, uh, you know, uh, countries in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the global south and, and you meet lots of people in particular in the elite group Uh, you know, saying, uh, okay, it's too early to redistribute. We first need to get rich and then we will redistribute. You know, this is not the way rich countries become rich. They, 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 they reach higher level of inequality together with the, the process of getting richer and getting more prosperous. And, and uh, in particular, through investment in more education and a more equal access to, 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 to basic goods. So that's a sort of big picture for income distribution. Now, one of the novelty of the World Inequality Report 2022 is that we now have a world uh, perspective also on the concentration of wealth and capital ownership. Uh, and here, you know, the, the, the main finding is that You know, inequality, as far as inequality of wealth is concerned, uh, it's pretty extreme, pretty much everywhere. So, you know, in terms of income inequality, there's been a movement toward more equality, uh, uh, in, in especially in, in, in Europe and to a lesser extent in North America, Japan, over the course of the 20th century. When it comes to wealth inequality, this movement toward more equality is, is much more limited. Uh, in, so if you look at Europe today, you know, the share of the bottom 50% in total wealth uh, is, is about uh, 5%, uh, which, you know, okay, this is uh, four, actually 4%, I think. It's, it's better than in Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa, where it would be 1% or 2%, but, you know, it's, it's extremely small for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for, the, for the for bottom 50%. So there, there has been some progress over time in the sense that the share going to the top 10% used to be 80, 90%, and now it's only 60% in, in Europe, which is still very high for 10% of the population. So there has been some redistribution towards this middle 40% group, you know, the group that is in between the top 10 and the bottom 50, but uh, regarding the bottom 50, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very, very low pretty much everywhere. And so one of the issues I, I address in my book, A Brief History of Equality, is, you know, if you want to go further toward more equality of wealth, uh, you cannot just wait for uh, growth and you know, market competition, whatever, uh, to do the job, because otherwise we would have seen that happening for a long time. And, and, and so that's why you know, in my brief history of equality, I talk about more uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, voluntaristic policy, like uh, minimum inheritance for all, uh, you know, everybody at age 25 receiving uh, 120,000 euros or 60% of average wealth per capita. And, and you know, we can, We can talk about this, but the, the bottom line is, you know, there's been more progress toward income equalities and toward wealth uh, uh, equality. 
the, the, the other dimension in which the World Inequality Report 2022 is uh, trying to make some progress is, is uh, regarding the coverage of gender uh, inequality. And so here I show you a very simple indicator which is the share of total labor income, including uh, wage income, self-employment income, going to a uh, woman. And as you can see, so here the bottom line is, you know, it's pretty far from 50% everywhere. So if you, you know, if you look at, at existing survey, women supply at least 50% of total labor hours. Uh, if you include in particular domestic labor, they, they, they usually uh, supply much more than 50 hours of 50% uh, of total labor hours pretty much everywhere. So if that was the target in terms of gender parity, you can see that we're pretty far. So there's you know, a little bit of progress in North America and Western Europe, but you know, even, even today, you have uh, you know, the share of total labor income going to women will be 36, 37% uh, in, West, in North America or Western Europe, you know, as opposed to 62, 63% for men, uh, uh, which you know, I think is a way to look at gender inequality, which is in a way more meaningful than when we look at the gender gap for a given occupation. Because in practice, the, the point is that women don't have access to the same occupation as men for all sorts of uh, reasons, as we know. And, and I, you know, this indicator at least takes uh, all of this into account. You can see that there are areas of the world like Middle East and North Africa where the uh, woman share is very small. Uh, that being said, you know, back to 1970, I don't show you the data here, but back to 1970, uh, in Western Europe, it was only 20%, 20 to 25% the, the female share. So, you know, it was not that much larger than Middle East, North Africa today. You can see that it's declining in China, partly because the top wealth, top wage share is increasing and it's mostly made of uh, men uh, in China, like in, uh, like in the US or in Europe. And, and so that's, that's what's actually making a decline in the, in the, female share. Um, um, okay, I mean, there will be a lot more to say about this, but let, let, me, let me move to the, the other novelty of the uh, World Inequality Report 2022, which is to propose a coverage of the world in terms of inequality in per capita emission. And so here, what's, what's really striking is, to, is the following. Okay, we all know that we have enormous inequality in carbon emission uh, between countries. Okay, we know, you know, South Asia, India has average carbon emission, which are extremely small, like, uh, you know, two tons uh, uh, per capita. And, uh, you know, Pakistan, uh, you, know, uh, you know, is suffering from the consequences of, uh, uh, you know, the accumulated historical emission coming from the global north. So we, we all know about this, you know, huge inequality in carbon emission between countries and in particular between the global north who have, who have been accumulating all this carbon emission and the global south who is going to suffer largely uh, from, the, fr from this emission. Here, what I want to stress is that in addition, there's also enormous inequality within the north and within the south. So if you look Again, you look here within Europe or within North America or within each region of the world, take within Europe, you know, the bottom 50% right now has an average carbon emission of about five tons per capita. In some countries, it's four tons. I mean, it's still too much. It should go down towards three or two in the future, but it's not completely off the mark with respect to the official target for 2050. The problem is that if you look at the top 10%, you know, they have an average carbon emission of 29 uh, tons in Europe, 73 tons in, in, in North America, mostly in the US. Uh, and, and in Europe, if you look at the top 1%, it will be also, you know, 70, 80, 90 tons or over 100 tons in some countries. So you have this enormous inequality in carbon emission. And, you know, it's clear that if you uh, if, you, if, if, if you don't reduce drastically the level of inequality within countries and you know, also at the, at the global level, you are not going to be able to, to, to reduce uh, this level of carbon emission. You know, if, you, if you go to the bottom 50% people and you tell them, okay, 
you know, everybody, you, you need to reduce uh, your, em your carbon emission in pro everybody is going to reduce their carbon emission in proportion to their initial level, and you're going to have a gigantic uh, um, carbon tax or gigantic increase in energy prices, which we see to some extent today, and, and everybody will have to reduce their emission in proportion to their initial level. You know, you're going to end up with a gigantic uh, yellow vest uh, movement uh, everywhere because people in the bottom 50% will tell you, uh, look, you first need to, uh, you know, reduce the emission uh, coming from people at the top, coming from private jets or coming from all these uh, lifestyles which are producing, uh, you know, 30 tons per year, 70 tons per year, sometimes 100 tons per year of carbon emission. So I, I think that's really pointing out to the fact that, you know, there's no credible manner to address uh, our um, uh, uh, environmental challenges without reducing drastically the level of in economic inequality that we have, both uh, uh, within countries and, and you know, uh, also, of course, between countries. And you know, I think one of the big uh, limitations, for instance, of the discussion we had last year about the minimum tax on multinationals, et cetera, is that we should have used this discussion to redistribute uh, uh, some of the tax revenue to the uh, global south, you know, which is supposed to receive uh, compensation uh, uh, in order to adapt to climate change from the global north, but which the global north is not uh, paying. And instead of waiting for the voluntary payment to happen, I think we, we have at some point to move to a different system where you have a sort of automatic uh, uh, international tax system where at least a fraction of the tax revenue coming from multinationals and coming from top wealth and top income taxpayer in the world is, is redistributed to all countries, in particular in the South, you know, in proportion to their population and to their exposure uh, to, um, to, to, uh, to climate change. And you know, I, I don't know how much time it will take to get there, but you know, I, I think you know, this is the, the only way to, to, to try to solve some of our uh, challenges. So, this is, you know, I, I wanted to start with this big picture coming from the World Inequality Report. And, you know, I have already touched upon a number of topics of, of my book of this brief history of equality. So let me now, you know, uh, go more to the book. So this is, uh, uh, so this is, you know, I, I've, I've tried to write a shorter book than what I used to write in the past. So, you know, I, I have written three, uh, pretty big books on the history of uh, inequality in the past. You know, my first book was on France in 2001, Top Income in France in the 20th century, and Capital in the 21st century in 2013, then Capital and Ideology in 2019. Now, each of these books is 1,000 page long. Uh, so, you know, this is really, um, uh, you know, probably far too long. So, you know, I think if you, you know, if you don't have time for this, and you know, I understand that everybody has lots of things to do. You know, I really recommend that you read this one, a brief history of equality, which is like 250 page long, and which I think you know is uh, is uh, you know I have tried to synthesize and to summarize some of the main uh, lessons, in particular from capital and ideology, and by doing so, I think I, this has sort of forced me to be clearer, and I think this book is sort of clearer about the big picture and about the main conclusion. And and the main conclusion that I stress in this book, as I said earlier, is that. You know, in the end, in the long run, th there is a the beginning of a movement toward more equality, and we really need to build on this in order to think about the next step uh, uh, and, and in order to pursue this historical movement toward more uh, equality. So le let me uh, describe, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to give a full presentation of the, of, of the book, but let me show you, you know, the, the the, the, the table of contents. So, you know, it's a short book, about 250 pages, but still, uh, you know, there are 10 chapters. Each of one, each chapter is about 20, 25 pages long. Uh, so, you know, I start in chapter one with uh, showing the movement toward more equality in the long run, which I have started to talk about regarding income equality. Uh, I, I then I stress the very slow deconcentration of power and, and property, uh, uh, and the fact that the, the concentration of wealth and property has still remained very, very uh, um, unequal. And I will I will say a bit more about this in a minute. 
Then I, I talk uh, quite extensively about the uh, legacy of slavery, colonialism, the question of reparation, uh, in particular the case, uh, I stress the case of the, the, the public debt that was paid by IT to France and you know, the, the fact that, you know, in my view, in this example, but I think it's a sort of paradigmatic example that can help us to think about other cases, uh, of, of France, the French state uh, should, um, uh, should basically repay uh, this, uh, this, um, this, uh, this debt that was paid from IT to France between 1925 and the 1950s in order to compensate former slave owners, uh, French slave owners for their loss of property. So, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to answer uh, more questions about this uh, later on. Uh, then the book deals with what I call the great redistribution between 1914 and 1980, tries to develop a vision of participatory socialism where you know progressive taxation plays an important role but also even maybe more importantly you know the sharing of power and voting rights uh, in companies play an, an even bigger role and then the three final chapters are more you know are about you know racial inequality discrimination international inequality what i call you know exiting neocolonialism where i, I I talk more about the international economic system, the, the transformation of the international tax system in particular, which I, I was just uh, uh, referring to. And you know, I conclude with a more global perspective of you know, the world of more sort of democratic, ecological, multicultural socialism, which uh, I advocate uh, in, in, uh, in this book. So in what follows, you know, I'm, I'm going to explore some of these topics. Uh, first of all, you know, when, when I talk about, uh, you know, the slow, you know, the difficult emergence of a, of a patrimonial middle class and the slow movement toward more uh, equal distribution of wealth, you know, this is what I'm talking about. So here, this is the case of France, but it's quite representative of European societies in general. You can see that, you know, okay, the, the top 10% wealth share has declined, especially between 1914 and 1980, it has declined substantially. And, you know, we are not back to the level of 1914. In particular, the middle 40%, you know, have, uh, used to own very little. And today, you know, we have a, a middle groups which own, you know, a significant fraction of wealth, you know, individually, they are not very rich, you know, the middle 40%, they have about 40% of total wealth, which means that they each have about the equivalent of average wealth. So they each have in France today, that would be 200,000 euros in net assets. So this will be, you know, this middle group will include people between 100, 200, 300, 400,000 euros. So these are, that's a typical middle class group, which is made of people who are not very rich, uh, uh, individually, but who are very far from being poor and who actually don't like to be treated like poor. And, and you know, it's a major political transformation, the emergence of this patrimonial middle class, except that, you know, since the 1980s, it has been sort of trending back uh, downwards. Uh, uh, this is even stronger in the US where the, the, the share going to this middle class has been going down uh, even more. Uh, and, and also you can see that the bottom 50%, in fact, never really uh, got access to, to wealth. And, and you know, today in a country like France, they have 4% of total wealth. Okay, it was 2% in the 19th century. So you know, this 4% is better than 2%, but this is very limited. And so you know, then you know, this is why in the, in the book I said discuss you know, how you know, how can we do better uh, than this, uh, and, and, you know, in order to, to redistribute some of this uh, wealth. Uh, you know, I also stress that, you, you know, extreme patrimonial inequality is a situation that, you know, we had in all European societies, you know, in, in before World War I, France, Britain, Sweden. If we compare with the situation today, uh, uh, you can see, so here I take the average of Europe, 1913, Europe 2020, contrasted with United States today. You can see that Europe today is a bit more equal than, than Europe 1913, I, you know, substantially more equal in the sense that this middle, 40% group uh, has today, uh, you know, a significant fraction of wealth, but the bottom 50% has made very little progress. And in the United States, 
you know, the situation is sort of intermediate between Europe 1913 and Europe 2020. And, and in a way, you know, it's trending back more in the direction of Europe 1913. So, you know, there's been some progress over a century, but it's, it's even more limited than in Europe and it's trending uh, back in the, in the wrong direction. So how, you know, is it possible to change this? If we look at the very big picture of how we, we add more equality in the past, you know, probably the most important transformation was the rise of the social state, uh, in, in particular in Europe. So here you can see that before World War I, total tax revenue. So this is the average of Germany, Britain, France, and Sweden. I mean, you have variation between European countries, but you, you have a lot of similarities in the big picture evolution. So before World War I, total tax revenue were pretty small, less than 10% of national income. And most of this tax revenue will pay for, for the army, for police, uh, justice, and for the military and the, actually the colonial expansion in the rest of the world. And you know, very little was... Uh, was uh, being invested in education, else. So before World War I, total education budget in European countries was less than 0.5% of national income. In the US, it was a bit more advanced. It was about 1% of national income, which was not very large, but still it was more than in Europe. Now, over the course of the 20th century, you can see you know, total education investment has been multiplied by 10 in Europe from 0.5% of national income to 5-6% of national income. And you know, that's a typical example of a rise of social spending, which has contributed uh, uh, a lot both to more equality and also more prosperity uh, uh, in, the, in, in the long run. In the recent decades, you can see a stagnation of total educational investment in the context of a, a tot, you know, stabilization of total social spending which you know, I think is, uh, is problematic and explains also some of the uh, uh, economic uh, uh, stagnation. And you know, I think this, you know, what you have in this picture is a movement, not only toward more public spending, but to some extent a movement toward uh, uh, decommodification or demarketization in the sense that you have large sectors of the economy, in particular education and health, which have been organized outside the market to a large extent, and and you know this has worked pretty well, and I think you know we should think of ways to to expand this movement in new sector, including uh, um, uh, you know the, the energy sector, local transportation sector, water sector, uh, uh, you know environmental uh, sector, um, uh, culture, media. You know you have various forms of uh, you know non-profit organization which require various forms of public spending through uh, taxation, which also require more progressive taxation so that this can be socially accepted. But, you know, in any case, to make a long story short, you know, this is this movement towards the, the rise of the social state, which has brought at the same time more equality and, and more prosperity. Uh, it, it, this movement also uh, came with the rise uh, of progressive uh, taxation. So, you know, if you so this is relatively well known, but I think it's it, you know it's always important to remember that you know in the middle of the 20th century you had a top income tax rate and very high income of 80, 90 percent. So in particular in the United States, where uh, between 1930 and 1980 uh, the average uh, uh, top income tax rate applying to the very highest income was on average uh, 81 percent on average between 1930 and 1980 uh, apparently this did not destroy uh, american capitalism and in fact if anything uh, uh, american capitalism had in this period of time it's sort of maximum level of prosperity as compared to the rest of the, of the world. And, uh, and I think you know, the, the explanation is that, in fact, you don't need extreme inequality to, uh, to grow and to develop and to have innovation. Uh, you know, maybe you need uh, income gaps of uh, one to five, or you know, some people will say one to 10, one to 20. I think one to five is actually enough on the basis of uh, my reading of uh, comparative and international and historical evidence. But you know, in any case, one to 100 or one to 200, like what we have today, you know, is, is completely useless. And, and uh, on the basis of historical evidence, you know, when this very top income tax rate was set up, this did not reduce 
you know, economic prosperity, economic growth, innovation uh, in the United States with respect to the rest of the world, because the true source of economic prosperity is much more uh, education. And, and the thing is that historically, the United States uh, were, you know, had an educational advance in particular with respect to the rest of the world. So in the 1950s, uh, you have uh, 90% of the cohort going to high school in the US. Uh, at the same time, it's only uh, 20 to 30% in uh, Germany or France or Japan. And you have to wait until the 1980s, 90s to, to get uh, convergence in education and also convergence in uh, productivity and GDP per capita. So the, the, you know, the general lessons is that the true source of prosperity in the long run is much more uh, education and a relative equality in education than more and more inequality. Also, this invention of progressive taxation reduced a lot uh, income gaps from the top to the, the middle and the bottom and made more acceptable the rise of total taxation for the middle class and, and for the rest of society. And, and that's a problem we have today to make acceptable a new rise uh, of um, of, uh, of the social state and public spending is that uh, tax progressivity has, has, has largely uh, disappeared. So in the United States, you know, there was an attempt under Reagan, uh, of course, to cut progressive taxation and, and the, the justification was to say, you know, okay, maybe you're gonna have more inequality, but you're, we are going to grow so much faster than, you know, you will have a bigger pie to share and, and uh, you know, Everybody is going to benefit for that, and the average income and wages of average Americans are going to grow like uh, what you've never seen. Well, in fact, what we've seen is that the growth rate uh, of national income per capita was divided by two uh, in the US. And so, you know, that's just repeating what I've just said. Historically, very high progressive taxation, you know, was, was you know, was, was, was. I believe a great success in the sense that it did not hurt growth at all, uh, and it allowed for a, for a substantial reduction of, uh, uh, of inequality and contributed to the financing of social spending, including education, which uh, are the true, uh, the, the, true uh, the true source of growth and, and the stagnation of this educational investment also explain, you know, I think the decline of, of of growth in, in recent uh, decades in the US. So if we want to go uh, further in this direction, you know, I, I already mentioned the, you know, the redistribution of inheritance. So, you know, this will be, you know, an example where, you know, you would have uh, everybody at age 25 would receive a, a, a minimum inheritance of, you know, 120,000 euros in the, in the case of Europe, which would be about 60% of average um, uh, average wealth in, in, in Europe. Uh, le let me simply say that, you know, this is more than just money, uh, uh, you know, that's also a way to redistribute power because ownership, wealth ownership, capital ownership is always uh, uh, about power relation much more than simply about, uh, about uh, money. So, you know, when you own zero or when you only have debt, uh, you are in a very weak uh, bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis your the rest of society and vis-a-vis -vis your own life. You know, it means basically you have to to uh, to accept anything. You have to accept any job offer, any working condition because you know you need to to have a wage to pay for your rent. You know, if you have a family, etc. Whereas if you have 100, 200, 300 thousand euros or dollars, you know. Maybe for a billionaire, this looks like equivalent to zero, but in fact, it's very different from, from, from zero because it means you can, you know, you can start to bargain uh, when you are offered a job, work conditions that, that you don't want, you know, you can say no, you can uh, create a firm, you can buy your home so that you don't need to pay your rent each month. This puts you, you know, the set of opportunities are very different. Let, let me also stress that this, uh, minimum inheritance that I'm describing here comes together with the welfare state, together with the social state, together with free education, free public health, together with a minimum income, basic income scheme, maybe together with a job guarantee uh, thing like, like what has been uh, proposed in, in, in recent years. So this is not supposed to replace other arrangements. This is more, you know, an, an addition to everything. And, uh, 
and uh, you know, I'm, I'm so I'm you know I'm not saying this is something that's going to happen next week. You know, I think this re would require an enormous political battle and social struggle to impose something like this. But I, I'm just saying, you know, if we want to set sort of new objectives for the future and we want to go beyond. The, the welfare state as it already exists in a number of countries and, and minimum income scheme as they already exist in a number of countries, uh, uh, in particular in Western Europe, you know, this is, this is the kind of sort of new uh, uh, target which, which we should think about if we want to change the, the structure of the distribution of wealth. And if we, if we don't do something like this, then probably we will keep having this very concentrated uh, distribution of wealth that, that we have uh, today. The, the other important dimension of the system of participatory uh, socialism that I have in mind, you know, together with the uh, rise of the continued rise of the social state and gradual decommodification of the economy and this redistribution of wealth is the sharing of power, you know, between workers and shareholders uh, in uh, companies. And so here, I, you know, I describe a system of voting rights uh, uh, with a maximum number, a share of voting rights that can be held by a single shareholders where basically the idea is that you are, you know, if you if you are a single shareholder in your company, in a very small company, and you are also an employee of this company, then you can have more than 50% of voting rights for yourself. But as the company gets big, so here the threshold is uh, above uh, 10, uh, 10 employees, in effect, you lose the majority of voting rights, you know, even if you are a, a single shareholder, and you need to you, you need to discuss. Basically, you need to have a coalition with your worker. So technically, here's the system that I'm describing here is a, a radical extension of the system of sort of co-determination or co-management that, that already exists in countries like Sweden or Germany, where you have, uh, 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 you know, up to 50% of uh, board members in, in the board of large companies in, in Germany, which are um, uh, representative of, of workers. Uh, now, uh, th there are lots of limitations in this existing system in Sweden and Germany. Uh, you know, the, the main uh, first limitation is that it only applies to very large companies. Here, it applies to all companies. Uh, and, and the other addition here is that you have 50% of voting rights for workers representative in all companies large and small. And in addition, for the 50% the of voting rights going to shareholders, here I, I, I propose to put a, a, a maximum, you know, a cap on, on how much a single shareholder can have in large companies. And here I, I the cap uh, equal to 5% uh, uh, of voting rights in companies uh, over 100 workers. And you know, then you have a formula from going from small companies to companies with over 100 workers, which gives you uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this graph. You know, of course, there are lots of variation you can, you can think of, but you know, the, the general idea is simply that um, you know in a, in, a, in 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 societies which especially which are you know very educated with lots of uh, workers uh, uh, technicians uh, managers uh, engineers etc people who invest their skills uh, in in the you know long run uh, evolution of their companies you know much more than what short run uh, capital investors do uh, you need to share uh, power and and you know the experience from the German or Swedish model is that having more voice for worker representative is actually good uh, for the long run uh, investment strategy of the company. So here this is going a lot further. So again, I'm not saying this is going to happen next week, but I think you know if we if we um, if we think of a way of going beyond the kind of social democratic uh, model that was developed in the 20th century. That would be uh, that would be the way the way to go. Okay, there will be a lot more to say, in particular about about true educational justice, you know, which is which is another important component of uh, of, of the, the the system I'm describing. I mean, here you see this is data coming from work by uh, Emmanuel Saez, Rashetti, where you have parental income on the one hand and, and probability to access higher education on the other hand, and you can see 
you know, it's almost the 45 degree line, you know, when your parents, uh, well, not quite, you know, if your parents are very rich, you only have a 95% chance to go to university. So it's not 100%. And if your parents are very poor, you have 25% chance. So it's not 0%, but, you know, it's almost, it goes almost from zero to 100%. And of course, uh, the, in practice, the university you go to are not the same in both cases. So, so in a way, it's even worse than that. And in, in a, country like France, where you have a, a pub, mostly a public educational system, in fact, you can see the inequality in educational investment can, can be also very high because, you know, the, here I look at the total educational spending received by the top 10% of students, you know, who go to more elitist schools, as opposed to the bottom children who, uh, who don't go for higher education. And, and you can see an enormous uh, inequality in, uh, in, uh, in total educational investment received. So, so what I mean here is that, you know, no country is in a position to give lessons about educational justice. You know, I think there's huge hypocrisy about educational justice in the US, of course, but, you know, also in France, I, you know, I think pretty much everywhere. And I think it's important to, you know, to set uh, targets about what we mean by educational justice, which can be verified collectively, where you know we can involve uh, you know a citizen, a trade union, uh, uh, you know collective organization uh, in order to to you know monitor this. You know otherwise we will keep you know this kind of abstract uh, discussion about uh, equal opportunity, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, without a clear target. Uh, uh, educational inequality, of course, from an historical perspective is very important because, you know, over time, it has declined a little bit. Here you can see that the concentration of educational spending was even bigger in France in 1910 than it is today, although, you know, it is very large today. It was even higher, you know, colonial societies. Here I look at Algeria 1950, where basically you had a complete segregation of the school system, a little bit like in the south of the United States, except that, you know, I think in, in some ways it was even more unequal in the south of the United States because the, the, the budget uh, per, per student were officially much, much larger in the, the schools for the children of the settlers and for the schools of the Muslim Algerians. So, you know, I think it's quite important in a French and European context to to, to, to look at this because, you know, sometimes in France or in, in, or in Europe, you know, people uh, imagine that segregation and racial segregation, you know, is a U.S. invention and is something that, uh, you know, is not uh, something, is not a serious issue in, uh, in European history. Well, you know, if you, if you look at the, at the colonial empires, of course, it uh, gives you a very, a very different picture. And more generally, you know, if we want more, uh, uh, you know, equality at, at the world level today, it requires us to realize that, you know, when you look at income gaps between countries today, we are still, you know, at the beginning of a process of, you know, what I call here the long exit from colonialism. So, so, so here I'm, I'm looking at a simple indicator uh, of uh, uh, income inequality between countries. And, and you can see that today, you know, it has started to decline a little bit thanks to the rise of China and, and to some extent, a number of other countries in the, in the global south, but inequalities uh, uh, between countries, you know, are still uh, enormous from an historical perspective, much, much bigger, for instance, in, in the early 20th and 19th century before the rise of, uh, of modern uh, uh, colonial uh, colonial empire. So, so that's, uh, you know, if we want to go beyond that, and, and you know, I'm going to stop there, uh, I think it requires the kind of structural transformation uh, in the uh, international economic system, international uh, tax system that I was uh, referring to earlier. So let me stop there, and uh, I'd be, you know, very, very happy to, to, answer, uh, to answer questions. Thanks a lot for your attention.